happy Sunday morning and welcome to another episode of Collider Mailbag. I am your host, John Roca. I am joined today by William the Beast Bibiani Schmodown, legend already, uh, movie critic, film pundit, and all around uh, social media opinion maker about numerous things in the world of entertainment. Uh, Bibs, thanks so much for taking the time. How are you? Uh, that's very flattering. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you for having me here on Mother's Day. Happy Mother's yeah, Day, everybody. Happy Mother's to all Day. of our mothers and to everyone in our audience who has a mother. Uh, just. Happy Mother's Day. <laughs> set, set, spread the love. All you, really. All it's you great. mothers. All you mothers. Hi, happy Mom. Mother's Day. Yes, hi, Mom. I know uh, you're wearing the shirt for the Schmodown. Still standing? I am. Yeah, this there is available go. at the uh, Schmodown Tea Public Store right next to Wild Berries. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, pump your, pump your stuff. That's they get fun. enough uh, attention. All right. Uh, well, you know how this works, uh, babe. So let's tell the fans you guys send in your questions, which we really appreciate. They are some incisive, specific questions, so it's always fun to get your questions. You can send them in when we put the call outs on social media, on Twitter, and on Instagram. Or if you hate social media, you can email us at mailbag at collider.com. I pour through a bunch of the questions that you guys uh, uh, send us. I pair them down to about 20, 25, send them on to my guest. My guest picks five that they really like and are excited about. Out, and we talk about it on the show and i think we've picked five really great ones babe. uh there was a huge list of really really awesome mm. props you guys have really interesting things on your mind lately and narrowing them down to five was really hard yeah so uh, i hope we did a good job i hope you like what we talk about today because yeah, we'll i think it's cool stuff especially your mothers all right let's go into it <laughs> <laughs> the first uh, e e question that comes on, on in email from oscar andrea he writes hey john an admirable guest oh what a nice guy oh, well, thank you there you go I didn't even know who i was <laughs> <laughs> i went on box office mojo recently to check on Endgame's total gross, as everyone does, I noticed that Hellboy was nowhere to be found. I did some research and found out that Hellboy isn't playing at all anymore, and the movie was a total flop by losing over $75 million. What are your thoughts on this topic? Keep up the good work. Stay sweaty. Bibs. All right, well, there's a couple of things going on here. First off, uh, Hellboy was a trouble production, as mm. a lot of us know, and um, yeah, it was kind of doomed from the start. There's a lot of people who weren't happy with how it turned out. Personally, I thought it was kind of cool. I thought it was kind of like this interesting R-rated horror movie mashup combined with a superhero movie. It mm. doesn't have that sort of fairy tale mentality that Guillermo del Toro brought to his movies, but as its own beast, as this like, if it had come out in 1986, it would have been like the, a really popular cult movie now mm. kind of thing. Um, I, I dug it. For me, the issue here is it's sad that it didn't make a lot of money and then we we'll probably won't get a sequel to this. But more than that, I think what this really speaks to is how horrible it is at the box office right now if you're not marvel or if you're not dc or if you're not one of these huge motion picture franchises mm. if you don't make your money opening weekend if you don't make a stand opening weekend you are gone not mm. only are you gone you are labeled a flop you're going to have to live with that and it's going to be that much harder for people to give your movie a fair shake even later on oh mm. hellboy is on netflix or amazon or whatever should I give it a chance? No, I heard it sucked. And then it might take 10, 20 years of this movie to find an audience. Mm. That, I think, is the tragedy. It's a fair point you make, Bill, because you look at the you look at Blade, you look at The Crow. These are films that kind of slid in there in time when there wasn't a superhero explosion like we see now and really got a good cult following uh, for them and made decent money at the box office. They were allowed to find an audience exactly. over time. They didn't right. have, Blade didn't have a huge opening weekend, yes. but it did well enough and it stayed consistent that it, it ultimately changed the industry. And now mm. it's almost impossible to do that again unless you have a big opening weekend which is hard to do unless you have a hundred million dollar marketing budget. yeah and it's unfortunate too you get you, the cast i think you know david harbour uh, uh daniel day kim these are not uh, uh mila jovovich these are not necessarily names that are going to put butts in seats no. and you get neil marshall who's jumping over from doing a lot of tv work to jump in to do this film as a director You're like well, what's the pedigree here so people were taking a chance on the possibility of a hellboy reboot mike nola did say that this script was the most authentic and uh connected to his own world that he created in the comics so it's unfortunate that they couldn't make it work for the most part you liked it i haven't seen it yet because of the bad reviews so i fall into that i know a lot of campaign people, i know a lot camp. of people who thought that it was silly that it was weird yeah. that it was camp and yeah it's hellboy that's right that's the comics it's it's all those things it can be totally badass and then totally ridiculous often at the same time mm -hmm. and that can be a clash that's not mainstream yeah it's not Something like Avengers, something like Shazam, something like Captain Marvel is designed to appeal to as many people as possible. This was a mid-budget, I mean, like, it was expensive for any it general was. movie, but for yeah. a superhero movie. This is sort of a more of a mid-budget kind of superhero movie. 
that was R-rated and it was very specifically keyed into a more cult genre mm. audience. And yeah, I, they were probably shooting themselves in the foot. Even the Guillermo del Toro Hellboy movies didn't make that much True. money. True. If you're not a marquee kind of film, it's really hard to get noticed. It just yeah. is. And that's sad. And with Disney, you know, consuming Fox the way that it has, and now Fox is going to release less than half as many movies mm. next year as it does this year. Yeah. We're just not going to get that level of competition. No one's going to be able to compete with it, at least not as often or at least not as much. And something like Hellboy has infinitely less chances to strike. Yeah. And certainly with uh, this t at dropping it at this time when you know we're on the heels of Aquaman, Captain Marvel, yeah. Shazam, and now Avengers Endgame, it really wasn't the field of play that they should have released this movie in. Maybe later in the year. Maybe in, like in August movies. or even in October where yep. you could have built it as like the horror movie. Yeah, that's a great point. It's very gory movie. from what I've heard. Be so. It's extremely gory. Yeah. And I thought that was part of the appeal. I thought this was like reading an issue of Fangoria that came to life. Mm. And yeah, there are people who just weren't on board with that. Yeah. And they were, I saw, I was in a theater with a bunch of fellow critics who were laughing at all the things I was laughing at. But when I left, they were like, that was terrible. I'm like, no, you enjoyed it on its own merits. Right. It knows it's weird. It's okay to call it weird. So I do hope Hellboy finds an audience. It's a strange film. It's a flawed film. But I feel like we're really forgiving about strange and flawed genre films like 10 years after they come out. Mm -hmm. But for some reason, oh, yeah. for some reason, the first weekend, we're always like jumping down their throats. Mm -hmm. Like, oh, this wasn't perfect. Don't go see it. I'm like, no, it's not perfect. Go see it. It's interesting. Yeah. I would say Watchmen falls in that category. Sure, why not? It didn't do well initially, but it's grown in appreciation as the years have gone along. And certainly the prequels, you could argue that as well, even though they're not independent films. But all right, what's our second question? Uh, oh, yeah. Uh, our second question yeah. here is uh, uh, about a certain Mr. Wick. <laughs> uh, Admark uh, from Instagram asks Hello Roca and guest If John Wick 3 sticks the landing Would you consider it one of the greatest Action franchises of all time If not what is hashtag Collider Mailbag? <laughs> well, I, I think if it sticks, it's in my opinion, having seen it last night, I would say, non-spoiler-wise, it absolutely sticks to landing. I thoroughly love the movie. I think it comes back to the spirit of number one, which is what I was missing in number two. So that's why I can't 100% call it uh, one of the greatest action franchises of all time, because for me, two didn't quite 100% work. Lethal Weapon, to me, is probably the number one. If you go the really? first three films, first three films, if we're going first three films, then I would put Lethal the weapon in there, Raise the Lost Ark, I would put in there. But you, you can't cherry pick, though. Like, well, if we're doing of three. But are we saying three? It doesn't I, say three. It's I'm just taking franchise. three. All okay, right. see, I think that's arbitrary. <laughs> I think we're way too obsessed with trilogies. Okay. I think if, if, it's, if it's not a trilogy, it's not a trilogy. If there are four movies, it's not a trilogy. Well, there might I be would more. love to ignore Kingdom of the Crystal Skull. <laughs> I would love to. I actually don't hate that movie the way other people do, but it's right. not good. Like, right. I, I, it is not a good movie. So, like, for me, first of all, I saw it too, yeah. and I do agree. I do think it's better than two. I think two got more interested in the, in the bureaucracy yeah. than the character. Way it, too, it went, went way too out there. The action was great. It just right. wasn't as interesting as John Wick 1. And for John Wick 3, I think, like, the first third is one of the best action movies I've seen in my life. Yeah, I agree with that. And then I think it falls back onto the, you know, plot contrivance right. bit. Of the, it's still really, really cool. And I do think although I'm not sure it's the last one, I feel like they could, there's more places they could go with it after mm -hmm, this. Mm -hmm. um, it's it's not too early to put this in the conversation. For me, we're talking about the greatest action movie franchises of all time. Mm. I think a lot of people default to like the Western action movies okay. in terms of like movies from America and that kind of thing, in which case um, there's a ton of cool stuff. You want to say Star Wars is an action movie franchise. Sure. It's great. Marvel MCU, of course. I, Lethal Weapon is a good pick. Mm -hmm. Even 4 is great action. 4 is great action, yeah, yes. It's, it, plot's terrible, but Action's mm, awesome. Right. Um, for me, in that tradition, it's I would have to go with Mad Max. Oh, Mad Max is a great choice. I think Mad Max, and they just get better. I like, agree I with think that. Road Warrior is better than uh, Mad, Beyond Thunderdome, yep. but Beyond Thunderdome is an incredible action movie. Mm -hmm. And it just and Fury Road, I think, surpassed even all of them. Mm -hmm. But I think there's also a ton of really amazing, exceptionally consistent action movie franchises if you go across the Pacific. Okay. And you get to franchises like Lone Wolf and Cub. Right. Or Zatoichi, these long-running uh, Japanese samurai movies, mm -hmm. which are violent, exciting, emotional, smart. And there's like over 20 Zatoichi movies. They're all good. Yeah, and if you haven't uh, explored the Zatoichi or Lone Wolf and Cub, those are both available in collections on Criterion, on mm -hmm. Blu-ray or DVD, and you get all Zatoichi 
Koichi films. You mm-hmm. get all the Low Wolf and Cub films. I bought them recently at, at a 50% off sale. And I They're think, incredible to And watch. I think some of them are available on the Criterion channel, yes. which is a new streaming service, right. which has a lot of great action, cult, and horror stuff on there as well, if you're not as interested in you know serious dramas and comedies. Mm-hmm. Um, there's also really a lot of really wonderful stuff from China, and you get like the police stories oh, or the Shaolin Temple films, mm-hmm. um, Once Upon a Time in China. There's a ton of really, really great action movie franchises that... I just feel like we don't talk about enough in America just because for a while they were largely unavailable. You know, like uh, Miramax and the Weinstein Company bought the rights to a lot of these things and then just refused to ever release them. Or cut them down. Or cut them down. Or or, or dubbed them. Dubbed them Which was the worst. Which was the worst. Badly dubbed them. Iron Monkey was bad. Oh, Iron Monkey was. Such a cool movie, but the dubbing was terrible. And they added plot points that don't make sense just to, ooh, it killed me. (laughs) Would you throw in the, oh, sorry. Would you you throw in the original Dragon with Girl with the Dragon Tattoo franchise? The original? I don't consider those an action movie franchise. I consider okay. those more like pot boiler, like airplane thrill, like John okay. Grishamy kind of things. Right. They're cool though. I just yeah. think they're more about There's like There's a lot of action movies. in those movies. There is. It, it, we're, we're, we're splitting hairs okay. here. Okay. You know, I would, I would definitely put James Bond on that oh, list sure. as well. But James, there's a lot of bad Bond There's a lot really. of bad Bond movies, but the interesting thing about it is that some of them are only bad because when you look back in context, this franchise has been going consistently right. for 50 years mm. and it's evolved with the times. And so it made the right movies for the right time. Even something like Moonraker, which is terrible. Yeah, terrible. Hit. It was a hit yeah. at the time. People wanted to see that Beautiful movie kill. at that time. Yeah, yeah. I, yeah, I actually kind of like that one. It's dumb, <laughs> it's dumb, but I consider dumb Bond movies to be real Bond yeah, movies. They're just they can be my fun. favorite Bond movies. Absolutely. So there's a ton of great action movie franchises out there. I think John Wick definitely has earned a spot in that conversation. All right, babe, she talked me into it. All right, well, you know, because I know it feels like there's more coming, so I don't want to judge it overall, but I think at this point, okay, all right, I think you can have the conversation that it's in the greatest action movie franchise has ever made. We'll see as it goes At along. least for now. I mean, what if yeah. they make another one or a spinoff or something and it sucks? Well, like, there is then a TV. we have to factor that in. There is a TV series in the works, so and we'll see. It could justify it. They have yeah. enough mythos in there. That's for sure. For, for sure. Yeah. Uh, let's move on to our third question. That's from Email Armani. Armani writes, Hey guys, huge fan of all the Collider shows. I was wondering where or how I could start reviewing movies for fun. I want to start getting some experience writing about films and dissecting them. I'm a huge movie nerd and want to start expanding my knowledge in every aspect. Vibs, you, I love this question. Yeah, you as we, a working we need movie more, Well, we need more film critics. We need more voices. We need more experiences. We need more people who are not just watching the movies, but talking about the movies and are putting in the work to understand how the medium works, how these movies fit into historical context and social context, and not just applying the same old perspective that we've been getting over and over and over again. The community needs to grow. The downside is the industry has shrunk. Mm. So if you're, I'm just gonna give this caveat right now. I'm gonna support anyone who wants to be a, a film critic. If you're in it for the money or the fame, there are easier ways. <laughs> there are easier ways. It's very, very hard right it's now. True. There's not a lot of publications that are paying a decent wage right now. But if you, you're in it because it's what you wanna do, because it's what you're passionate about, there's a ton of things you can do. First off, um, you can start off just by do, using Letterbox. A lot mm-hmm. of people just post reviews on Letterbox. It's a good way to share what movies you're consuming with other people. Uh, I recommend, you know, you can get a free blog or a very mm-hmm. cheap blog, like on Blogger or something like that. Mm-hmm. And um, then you just start posting, start writing, start sharing your thoughts and your opinions. The most important thing I think you can do, especially if you're just getting started, though, is to learn. Just keep learning. Watch every movie you can. Don't get locked into a genre. Don't just say, oh, I just love the Marvel movies. you got to love every kind of movie, at least potentially. So watch your documentaries, mm. watch your historical films, watch silent movies. You gotta start reading. And I don't just mean read books about cinema. You gotta read everything because art doesn't exist in a vacuum. You gotta read novels, you gotta read nonfiction, you gotta read about art forms that you don't think have anything to do with movies and then you're gonna realize that they have everything to do with it because they all bleed in together. And it's really, really exciting to catch up and to find out like, oh, there's this movie out there that started all of these cool things I like about mm. all these other films. Yeah, I would throw in also, you should watch commentaries on a lot of these sure. Blu-ray movies, a lot of these classics, a lot of these Criterion films. They include these incredibly extensive commentaries where you start to hear what the producers were thinking, what the director was thinking, what the writers were thinking, what the actors were thinking. And it gives you an idea of how to approach analyzing a film, how to how an actor approaches, how a director approaches, how a producer mm. approaches, so you can start to understand how much more complex and fluid your review can be as you uh, understand how pe- different people with different jobs approach creating a film and it gives you a scope. And I would also throw in the fact that, look, 
podcasts. I do a million sure. of them. You can start a free one on Anchor and just start, at, you know, publicizing your podcast and don't get caught up with this thing of like, oh, I'm not getting a lot of views. Yeah, build yourself up. It takes time it and be me, willing to take the hits. It took me years to get published on a, on a respectable mm. publication. It took me more years to get paid a reasonable wage. Yeah. It's hard. It's really, really hard to get out there. But if you put in the work, if you are kind, Empathy is everything, not just in art appreciation, because that's all art is, hmm. is training us to think about how other people feel and think. If you can open your mind to that, if you people like working with you, if I highly recommend you learn to type. If, you, if yeah. you're typing like this, that's okay, but when you're a professional film critic, you have to do deadlines. Mm -hmm. So I recommend getting to at least 60 words a minute. I'm at about 115. Like if you can, wow. re you really, it really speeds everything up and it's mm -hmm. the best possible thing you can do there as a go. practical thing. But people like it if you send in copy that doesn't need to be edited, if you are trustworthy, if, if you're nice, if you mm -hmm. care about other human beings and if you know your stuff. The other thing I will just recommend if, mm -hmm. you're just, if that's kind of too general for you, after you develop sort of the general skills, and hey, take a class. You don't have to go to yeah. film school, but there might be a community college or something nearby that just has a great overview of film history. That'll teach you a lot of the terminology, a mm -hmm. lot of the basics. But after that, try to pick up an expertise. Like become like an expert in like one filmmaker or one period or one genre, because then you have something very specific mm -hmm. to sell people. Yeah. yeah, I know my action movies. I have an action movie podcast, or right. I know my Italian horror movies. I am an expert in Italian horror movies. That's useful. Yeah. So hopefully that'll get you started. It's complicated and there's no one path to success. Just get going, acknowledge that you don't know everything yet, but then try to learn everything and I, it'll be a rewarding path and find a genre like the outlaw did with the westerns yeah all right and biopics yeah biopics and western biopics oh ho, ho. what's your favorite western biopic oh that's a great question favorite western biopic because you, what comes to mind is uh is um is obviously the white herb movies okay uh you could kick it oh i would see my darling clementine is probably my uh, favorite that's a good one i love that that's one to pieces pick. with henry fonda yeah. um but you could throw in even what's the judge of roy bean the the yeah, judge roy I've bean that, one. that one's a great one oh, that yeah. uh, paul newman did lifetimes of judge roy bean mm -hmm. that's a great uh, western biopic as well there's a number of them out there yeah. so i didn't mean to derail no no it's okay. what's our fourth question <laughs> our fourth question is a long one so yeah. i'm going to try to get through as quick as i can uh uh, Glenn Myron writes, uh, hola, senior Roca and esteemed guest. Thank you. <laughs> I understand how Steve... Okay, so this is an endgame end one. So yeah, spoilers, 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 spoilers. spoilers. I understand how Steve Rogers got back in time to the different points in time he needed to go to replace the Infinity Stones and Mjolnir at the end of Avengers Endgame. That was made clear. What I am very confused about is how he traveled off-world. For instance, how did he get to Morag to replace the Power Stone and Orb, get to Volmir to return the Soul Stone, and did he just hand it to the Red Skull, or did he toss it off the cliff? How did that work exactly? And how in Midgard did Cap manage to get to Asgard to return Thor's hammer and the Reality Stone? And once there, what did he do? Sneak up and use that device Rocket used to extract the ether from Jane Foster and inject it back into her somehow without her noticing? <laughs> Mjolnir is easy. He could just leave the hammer laying around anywhere. But the Reality Stone is a bit more tricky. As far as I can tell, Steve did not have an access to a spaceship in these past times, so I have no idea how he got up world. It's a great question. And uh, I think a number of theories can apply to this situation certainly you had the hammer so the hammer can it, it transport you places if you see it in the comic books Ooh, that's a good stone. point yeah it I does you that. can that's just clever. roll and ride the hammer where you're gonna go so i don't know how extensive the power of the hammer is also i wonder if it calls the bridge to get you to asgard right it i can, don't I, I think i think only uh idris elba can do that right uh, but, so, I, the but he can has call the hammer you, yeah you, you can, can use the that. hammer to yeah, call yeah. to go and then at that point it does whatever maybe injects it in but cap's always a sneakily good guy and accomplish missions that's what he does best is accomplish missions so he'd figure out a way to get all these things placed in time so that he could end up with peggy that's my question is how does one cap exist and the other cap exist in the same timeline i don't think they do does peggy hide cap or does cap never become part of the avengers I don't think that's what sense. i want to know for me the the rules of time travel in marvel comics is what is evoked in endgame yeah and in marvel comics the rules were this if you go back in time and change anything like anything right you don't go back to the same timeline they talk about it in the movie it's not causality it's not you're changing your own timeline. you go back to your old timeline but you did change something yeah that creates an offshoot reality so the only thing that makes sense to me is cap went to went back in the past and mm -hmm. said screw whatever in this and he marries peggy somewhere mm -hmm. in the past creating an offshoot reality and then at some point as an old man he uses the last of his pin particles to go back to our reality mm -hmm. and then pass off the torch 
to sand. Right. That's the only thing that but makes sense. But how does he do the stones? Uh, the stones I don't get. And here's the, th <laughs> and here's the thing I think is worth pointing out. Uh, it's a time travel story. It doesn't make sense. It never makes sense. <laughs> Remember in Back to the Future how like the ending of that movie makes no sense, but it took people like three decades to really hone in on why? Yeah. That's because the movie was good. Right. Because the movie is so good, you don't think to yourself, oh, well, that doesn't quite make sense. Or you do, but you put it out of your head because you like it so much. With the Marvel movies, and to a different extent, you know, the DC movies, Star Wars, the stuff we really geek out about, we watch over and over and over again. They're not necessarily made to be watched a million times. Mm -hmm. Because you watch anything a million times, you're going to notice little things that make no sense. I get in arguments with Christian Harloff about, like, Star Wars all the time. Yeah. And the only reason why is because... We're not supposed to have watched Star Wars a million times. Right. If you do, every line of dialogue can be picked apart and it doesn't track and there's something something wrong with it. And I think we're overanalyzing these things sometimes. Mm -hmm. Endgame, it's okay if it has some plot holes. Like, I think that's what it boils down to is. There's some things that probably don't make sense. I would have loved to have seen the scene where Cap goes to Volmir and sees that the Red Skull is there. I want to hear that conversation. <laughs> that's a great conversation. That's going to be yeah. a really weird day. Yeah. But it also raises the question, okay, it's supposed to be a permanent exchange. You take the soul stone right. in exchange for someone you love. If he gives it back, does do they get the Black Widow back? That's the thing at the end of the day. I think we're going to find out, in my opinion, in, in Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3. You think, oh. I think we're going to find out, because, see, the thing a lot of people are arguing about is, who is he searching for? Which Gamora? Is it the Gamora that showed up from 2014? Mm -hmm. Or is he going to find the Gamora that he fell in love with? Does he say he's going to find Gamora? It says the picture, and it says searching at the end when he's on the ship. So he's And, he, and as soon as uh, Thor comes on, he hides it uh, and makes it seem as if he wasn't looking that up. So uh, he is trying to find out where Gamora is. Okay. And, I, and we didn't see Gamora get dusted, so people have argued, well, she survived because she turned on Thanos, so the the, uh, she, the snap would know. But it's, no, she came with Thanos. No, no, no. So the, who the, knows? The, but they specifically said the snap couldn't affect the Scarlet, uh, the, not Scarlet Witch, uh, the Black Widow, right? Because that was a permanent exchange. You don't have the Soul Stone to make that decision unless they're dead. Right, right. That would hold true for Gamora as well. Right. I wonder, and that's what I wonder. If if you return the stone, do you get the soul back? What happens with that? I wonder. And I think the greatest thing is what happens when he confronts Red Skull again. Right. Exactly. I want to see that scene. Yeah. I want to see that scene. I think so, we're gonna get that down the road. I think we are. But I also think it's it's important to as much as as much fun as it is to nitpick every. Yeah, Marvel yeah, yeah, yeah. movie, every Star Wars movie, there is a line. And I love what Marvel used to do with this in the comics. They used to say, mm -hmm. if you find like a huge plot hole or some weird thing that cannot be explained, some inconsistency, the fun isn't just pointing it out and saying, ha ha, you suck. The point right. is, the fun is, how does it work? Fix it yeah. in your head. And what they would do is they would give out a prize. It was called a no prize. That was basically, okay, I found this thing. Well, She-Hulk said this in her storyline, but in West Coast Avengers, she said this. It doesn't make sense, but I found a way to make it work. That's when you get a prize. Yeah, agree. So the fun isn't so much picking the holes in it. The fun is figuring it out. And I love that you're trying to figure it out. And I think there are explanations. Some of them are more confusing than others. Yes, they the all Russo raise brothers. Questions, yeah. But um, I also find that filmmakers tend to think about these things a little less than the fans do. They're more concerned yes. about the emotional journeys of the characters. Well, if, you, if you're noticing the coffee cup that I'm doing a bad job in, in in the overall scope of the TV show or movie I'm creating. Well, and you bring up Game of Thrones, right. which is another one where I guarantee you the vast majority of the people who watched an episode of Game of Thrones didn't notice that coffee cup of course because not. they were invested. But so many people consumed it. Right. People probably watched it frame by frame. So many times someone noticed it, and now it's all we can see. Every movie, every TV oh, yeah. show has flaws. If we had this culture back in the 70s oh. and 80s and 90s, we'd have torn apart so many films before they ever became classics mm -hmm. or beloved by us. And that's where I think we need to turn it down a little bit or pull the reins yeah. on a, a little bit because we have to let films breathe and be what they are. And yes, do they are there plot holes? Sure. Mm -hmm. Are the mistakes made? Great. But the, obviously by the box office, a majority of fans don't give a shit. And so they just <laughs> want to enjoy themselves and they enjoyed themselves in Endgame and a number of films. Like, Aquaman makes no sense to me. No. Made over a billion dollars. And that's fine. And listen, and there, are, right. there are legit narrative or thematic issues you can have with any of those movies. Right. Like, I've heard critiques of, course, of Endgame of course. that are perfectly valid, and if it's okay to say you don't like it, or it's okay to say this flaw really, really matters. But some flaws are just dumb gaffes. Yeah, exactly. That's it. They're little things. They decided it, made, it was more important to give Captain America a great, satisfying emotional ending than to have that emotional ending make perfect sense. Right. Uh, yeah, which I agreed with. Let's move on, because we're running out of time here. Oh, no. Our last question is from Lewis Idol. He writes, hey guys, when I was 
younger, the only composers I really know were Hans Zimmer and John Williams, but as I grew up, I came across so many great scores and composers that I feel don't get the same recognition as those big names. Who do you think are some of the more underappreciated composers both today and throughout film history? Thanks for everything you guys do, Lewis. Uh, Thanks, Lewis. Uh, I feel like composers, with the exception of some of the big ones like Hans Zimmer and like mm. John Williams, uh, James Horner, Danny Elfman, some of the big ones, um, they tend not to get the glory and the spotlight. And there are some people who say that that is the mark of a great composer. Mm. They're not supposed to overshadow the film. Personally, I think that's a little limiting. I think a great okay. composer, I think the, the score, the non-diegetic score to a movie is the movie's inflection. Mm -hmm. It's the difference between just telling someone what happened and putting like a flashlight under your face at a campfire and like going big arms, like really selling it. <laughs> and that's why f f big, big yeah. composers like John Williams and Hans Zimmer get the most credit. But there's a lot of really great ones out there. Um, let's see, who are, who are some of my favorites? Uh, Anton Karas, who did the incredible Zither score for The Third Man. Okay, It's an awesome film noir, very, very dark, but it has this yep. very playful score. It's with that, like really with that, unusual, it's that beautiful. That little mini guitar thing it, they it, use, yeah. It's very odd, and it just makes that movie stand out so fantastically. Mm -hmm. Like it, it's almost not, it's almost completely the wrong score, but it's perfect. Right. Um, I'm also a big fan. You go way back. You get to someone like Max Steiner, who is considered the father of movie music. He was mm. there when movies went to sound, and he either invented or popular popularized a lot of the techniques we take for granted today. Like his score for the original King Kong, that kind of made mm -hmm. Mickey Mousing a thing. And when we say Mickey Mousing, it's when the score accompanies action. Like if you're walking down the street, bum, 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 bum. <laughs> bum, bum, bum. That's he did that. That was like his shtick, and he did incredible scores for everything from yeah. King Kong to Gone with the Wind to A Summer Place. Scores that people know, even if they've never heard of the movie. Yeah, really incredible. I could do more, but I'm curious. James, I, wanna... I, I mean, I love James Newton Howard and his sure. stuff. He's uh, really uh, underrated. Alexander Desplat is starting to finally get some attention for the stuff that he's done, Definitely. both film and television. Really interesting work that he's done there. Uh, I forget the lady's name, but the lady who composed Wonder Woman. She's incredible to bring yeah. her on to this. A project and have her deliver such a fantastic score and so there's so many uh, uh great and uh who the everyone who does uh, the scores for the spike lee movies mm -hmm. i think the malcolm x score is phenomenal i was and really I was takes hoping you black Klansman would have won this year as well yeah. um there's a lot of great cult and genre filmmakers who have wonderful scores in their films mm -hmm. uh if you're into italian cinema goblin has done some of the best scores ever uh, they did suspiria they did uh deep red they did phenomena those are some of the yeah. best scariest scores ever i think john carpenter is underrated. Oh, as Carpenter, a, as a absolutely. Sport. Halloween is one of the all-time top 10 yes. great movie scores. Just beautiful in its simplicity and absolutely terrifying. But mm -hmm. every like everything from Big Trouble in China to Escape from New York, mm -hmm. these are fantastic movies. And course. people are forgetting ab about Bernard Herrmann now and yes. need to go back and rediscover Bernard Herrmann from Citizen Kane, from before Citizen Kane and Citizen Kane on. Like there's oh, so yeah. much with no, Bernard, Bernard Herrmann. Herrmann. From Psycho, North by Northwest, Vertigo, mm -hmm. you know, they're the, the, the composers who we think of as ubiquitous now, people like Hans Zimmer. Yeah. Maybe John Williams will last, but I think someone like Hans Zimmer in 20 years yeah. after he's no longer making scores anymore and like those movies are now the movies that your dad liked, mm -hmm. um, he's going to become someone who is less well known and you're going to have to go back. I talk to young people who don't know who Ennio Morricone is. And yeah. that, that's a dagger in my heart. Oh, yeah. But it, uh, the upside, you get to go back and discover the incredible and prolific work of Ennio mm -hmm. Morricone yep. and all the great um, action movies, uh, uh, westerns yep. and dramas that he composed that are iconic and beautiful and damn near perfect. Jerry Goldsmith people don't talk about yep. as much anymore. Elmer Bernstein is one of the greatest composers Bernstein. we've ever had. There's a ton. Yeah, Maurice Jarre is another one I would throw in there as I'm looking here. I forgot about him and all the stuff that he'd done, including Lawrence of Arabia, Jesus of Nazareth, yep. Fatal Attraction, and even A Walk in the Clouds. And Ennio Morricone. That's a great movie. It is. And Ennio Morricone, I would throw in The Mission. His score for The Mission there is, you go. it will break you in half. And the score for Last of the Mohicans is phenomenal as mm -hmm. well. So there's that wasn't Morricone. So much. But yeah, no, no, but yeah, yeah, that's the, a great score. those are fantastic scores. That's actually scores. two scores that they combined. Right. Uh, that's that's a wonderful motion picture. I love yeah, that exactly. All right, yeah. well, we got to wrap up here. Thanks, Hello. everybody. <laughs> for watching this episode of Collider Mailbag on this wonderful Mother's Day. Hope you're having a great day. And hey, if today is the day that you're honoring your mother as well, we send out our hearts and our thoughts to you uh, for as you uh, roll through the day. You know, those are some for some people, those are tougher days. I lost my dad in 2008, so Father's Day is never a fun day to get through, but it's also a good day to remember the time I did have. So there you go. Um, Bibbs, thank you so much for stopping by. Thank you. Tell people where they can find you and all the stuff you're doing, my friend. I'm everywhere. <laughs> okay, so I write for the rap. 
I write for IGN. I write for Bloody Disgusting. I write for my own website, criticallyacclaimed.net. Uh, I have multiple podcasts, Critically Acclaimed and The Two Shot, are currently at the Schmozno Network. Uh, I have Cancel Too Soon. We review TV shows that lasted only one season or less. That's its own network. That's on iTunes, Stitcher, wherever fine podcasts are found. And we have a Patreon. It's patreon.com slash critic acclaim critically acclaimed was taken <laughs> but critic acclaim and we have a ton of bonus content we have bonus podcasts we're reviewing every single star trek episode ever made john's going to come in for some of those yes. we're very excited about that uh we have a podcast called only the best where we review every single nominee for best picture in chronological order wow. we've had to go to the ucla library because some of them are almost lost mm. like it's been really exciting to dig up some of these films um and a ton more stuff there besides we're doing commentary tracks everything it's Right. So patreon.com slash critic acclaim. We would love to have you. But more importantly, thank you everybody for watching. Thank you for loving movies and art and for supporting people like us and Collider mm -hmm. and everybody. Definitely. These are cool people and I love it every time they invite me on one of their shows. So thank you, John. And at William Bibiani, right? At William Bibiani on Twitter. <laughs> Sorry about that. And yeah. you're most welcome. Thanks for yeah. coming on. You guys can follow me at the Roca says on Twitter and on Instagram. And don't forget, send in your questions through when we put the calls out on social media on Twitter and on Instagram. Put that hashtag Collider mailbag. It makes it easier for me to find your question and possibly pick for the show or send it on email mailbag at collider.com pour through them pick them out pick out some great ones and as you see we answer them on the show and we dive deep so wipe the sweat off your brow from the film sweaty film sweat we got into today and enjoy the rest of your sunday thanks again we'll see you next week for two more new episodes of collider mailbag film sweat